Our next uh, speaker has quite a story to tell. Barnaby Howarth has suffered not one but several major illnesses and as you will see that does not define him. He's also reached great heights both figuratively and literally. I believe he has scaled Mount Kilimanjaro. So let's listen to his amazing story. We'll let him tell it. Please could you make Barnaby very welcome. Thank you, Joe, and thanks for having me at Communities in Control. Am I dressed? I feel like I've got things tucked under that shouldn't be tucked under. Turn down my collar. Thanks. Thanks, Mum. I didn't know you got a ticket. <laughs> I'm really honoured to be here today. Is that collar right now? I'm really honoured to be here today. Um, I'm here today because of two community groups who are thinking differently. The first of those groups is the Pennant Hills Demons AFL Club in Sydney. I probably wouldn't be alive if it weren't for the Pennant Hills Footy Club, let alone standing here today talking to you guys. In 2005, I was bashed in an alcohol-filled gang attack and had a stroke. After I came out of my four-day coma, my personal medical diagnosis was that the only reason I survived was because of the fitness I'd built up playing footy at Pennant Hills. I'll get to that story in a minute, but the second group I need to thank for being here is Warakiri College, a community learning centre in Sydney. I gave a speech at Warakiri about 18 months ago, and after that speech, one of the staff came over and suggested I get in touch with Dennis Moriarty about speaking at Communities in Control. I had no idea what this conference was all about back then, so I jumped online, did a bit of research, and the first thing that came up was last year's speakers list, Julia Gillard. Tony Abbott, Michael Kirby. <laughs> I thought I was kidding myself even emailing Dennis. But then I thought, no, what's the worst that's going to happen if I just give it a crack? So I sent Dennis an email. Thankfully, Dennis is the kind of bloke who thinks a bit differently. And he gave me a crack. And here I am. It's, <laughs> hey. it's thanks to the community groups in my world that I'm living the exact life that I want to be living right now. I just want to tell you guys my story today. It's a story about how two small community groups gave one man the chance to reclaim the life he wanted to be living. And if there's parts of my story you think you can take out and apply to your organisation or your own life, you're more than welcome. But if there's not, just sit back and enjoy the story. My name is Barnaby Howarth. I'm a type 1 diabetic and a stroke survivor. I'm also an ex-AFL footballer for the Sydney Swans, an author, a filmmaker, I have climbed Mount Kilimanjaro, thanks Joe. And a couple of years ago, I played my 100th game of AFL for Pennant Hills. And I want to talk to you guys today about how the organisation that you're representing at this conference might be making yours or someone else's life better, just by thinking a little bit differently about how you deal with disappointment. I really struggled finding my place in the universe after the disappointment of my stroke. But today, I know exactly where it is. It's right here, where I'm standing. Life isn't fair. Good things happen to bad people, bad things happen to good people. But dwelling on the why me's and the what ifs of a situation is just a complete waste of energy. Rain falls on the just and the unjust alike, but there comes a time where you just have to get over it and go and play in the puddles. Before my place in the universe was almost erased completely by the stroke, it was given a pretty major shake when I was 14 and I was diagnosed with diabetes. I didn't know much about diabetes at that age. But when I went and saw my GP, he told me that normal blood sugars should be between 3.5 and 8, but mine was 38. Yeah, exactly. I was, I was diagnosed with type 1, or juvenile diabetes, which means my body doesn't produce any insulin naturally. So I have to have my insulin manually, which I used to do using a needle like this one. Don't know if you can all see it, but you've all seen a needle before. But I've since moved on to the insulin pump which is this mobile phone looking thing I wear on my belt. When I was first diagnosed with diabetes, I spent a week in hospital, surrounded by diabetes educators, dietitians, my endocrinologist and my GP. So when I left after that week, I felt pretty confident that I knew what I had to do from a medical point of view to get my sugars under control. But the medical side of diabetes is the easy part. The hard part, for me at least, is just living with it in the real world. 
I found this out the hard way when I was out having lunch with my ex-girlfriend's family one day. And I stressed the word ex in that sentence. <laughs> I was still on needles back then, so when the food came out, I had to have an injection. So I took the lid off my needle, lifted up my shirt, was just about to have a stab, and my ex's dad turned around and snapped at me. He said, do you have to do that here? I just let that slide, because one day there's going to be a cure for diabetes, but that poor bloke's always going to be a tool. <laughs> if, I was, <laughs> if I was scared of anything after I was diagnosed with diabetes, it was what sort of life I'd be able to live now that I had it. I was a pretty keen Aussie Rules footballer when I, when I was diagnosed, but I didn't know if diabetes meant that I'd have to wrap myself in cotton wool, stop playing at the level I'd been playing at, and choose a different career path. But it was something I heard from AFL Hall of Fame player and coach Ron Barassi, who helped me see what I had to do now that I was diabetic. Barassi once said, there's no disgrace in failing. The only disgrace is if you only half try, or three quarters try, or 99% try. So with those words in mind, I thought all I can do now that I'm diabetic is jump back into the life I'd been living, give it 100% and see how far I could take it. That turned out to be a pretty good decision when I got a phone call from the Sydney Swans asking me to join them for the 98 season. I was living the dream that year at the Swans. I was 18 years old, a year out of high school, and I was playing footy for the team that I barracked for. I didn't think life could get any better. But then one day after training, thanks to a diabetes-related incident, it did. I, I was still on needles when I was playing at the Swans, and when we trained in the afternoons, I'd have to have an injection before I went home. So one day I went and sat in front of my locker, did the same thing, lifted up my shirt, took the lid off my needle, had my injection, and then when I went to stand up and walk out, thinking no one had been watching, turns out Tony Lockett and Paul Kelly had been standing there watching the whole thing. Tony Lockett, or Plugger, just looked at me, looked at my needle, looked back up at me, shook his head and said, bugger that. And then Paul Kelly, who was the Swans captain at, the, at that time and was voted the AFL's most courageous player three years in a row, looked me dead in the eye and said, you're a braver bloke than me. So I thought I'd found my place in the universe after that season with the Swans. If my place in the universe was as an AFL, a diabetic AFL footballer, I couldn't have been happier. I was actually so happy with where I was that I started writing my autobiography to try and tell other diabetic kids they didn't have to give up on their dreams just because they'd been diagnosed. I thought if diabetes was my life's one adversity, I'd done pretty well against it. But if I thought diabetes was my life's only adversity, fate laughed straight in my face in 2005. I was out having what I thought was a quiet drink with three mates of mine, but on the way home, one of my mates didn't like the way a kid was looking at him when he came out of a convenience store. So he went over and had an angry word and things got out of hand really quickly. My mate threw this kid on the ground and started kicking him while he was down. So I ran over and grabbed my mate, told him he was being a peanut and dragged him back to where our other two mates were and the four of us started walking away. We only made about 200 metres down the road though and we heard a heap of angry shouting coming from behind us. And we turned around to see this kid's group had grown from five to about 20. Some of them had their shirts off, some were yelling abuse, but they all looked like they just wanted to punch somebody and it wasn't too long before they got their wish. At the sight of the mob, Two of my mates did what we all should have done in hindsight and ran, but myself and one other guy stayed behind and tried to talk the mob down. My mate was kicking it from behind and then while he was lying on the ground unconscious, some guys stood around him and started kicking him in the head. So I ran over and shoved the kickers off and that's the last thing about the fight I remember. Apparently I was kicking it from behind and then kicked while I was down as well. After the fight I was 100%, my life went on 100% normally for the next seven days after the fight. I played a game of footy that weekend, went back to work on the following Monday, but the whole time I'd been, I'd been running around telling people how lucky we'd been this mob didn't have weapons, turns out an artery in my brainstem had been torn and now resembled something like an old garden hose and there was a heap of dried gunk on the inside of it in the form of clotted blood. But because I had no idea about the tear or the clots or the danger, I went back to footy training for Pennant Hills the next week and took part as normal as I would have before the fight. And it turns out somewhere during training I got a knock that dislodged a bit of the gunk and it floated up that artery to a part where it narrowed, where it lodged itself, interrupting the blood flow going in and out of the brain, which caused the stroke. And that's when things got really dramatic. My parents were told they might have to turn off my life support. My family and friends were told to come and say goodbye. And they were all told that if I did survive, I'd probably be a vegetable. I've since described myself 
as everything from a stroke survivor to disabled to a regular schmo. I really struggled finding my place in the universe after the stroke, but had I known how dire things had got while I was out, I would have thought of something a lot more profound to say when I woke up. When I opened my eyes, I saw that I was lying in a hospital bed that was surrounded by my friends and family. Some had come from interstate. state, my little brother had flown all the way back from Scotland, some of them were crying, and someone explained to me that I'd had a stroke on the Thursday, I'd been unconscious all weekend, and it was now Monday. And my first thought was, bugger, I missed a game of footy on the weekend. <laughs> I was the captain at Penn Hills and we're undefeated and we're playing against our arch rivals, so I was spewing. So I looked around at everybody, took a deep breath, some of them elbowed each other and said, shh, he's about to talk. And I said, did we beat North Shore? <laughs> Turns out we lost, so I was spewing. Thankfully, though, over the next few days, the reality of my situation took hold and things didn't look good. Essentially, what happened after the stroke was that the entire left side of my body, all the signals I'd built up from my brain to the left side had been wiped clean by the stroke. And I was going to have to relearn how to use my left side again. It's been nearly 10 years since the stroke. And in those 10 years, I've seen physiotherapists, occupational therapists, podiatrists, neurologists, neuropsychologists, and pretty much anybody else with an ust on the end of their title. <laughs> and they all told me exactly the same thing, that the only way to give yourself a chance of recovering from a stroke is to keep using your affected side as much as possible. But given the limitations I have on my left side these days, that's a pretty difficult task. One of the biggest challenges I have these days is something as simple as holding a pen. I've got a cerebral tremor in my left hand, which makes that shaking action. So as you can see, there's not too many good things about having a stroke. But if there is one, it's that it forces you to take stock of what's important in life. I used to think that winning was the most important thing in life. Everything I put my mind to, I wanted to be the best at. I thought, if you're not first, you're last. But after the stroke, I've gone without so many things that it's now the simple things in life that bring me the greatest joy. One of the things I went without after the stroke is something as simple as walking. My balance, I'll talk over this slide because it's pretty boring. My balance was so bad <laughs> after the stroke, I literally couldn't do this. I couldn't stand still in one position without falling over. So one of the best parts of my day these days is something as simple as getting off the train and walking to work. One of the other things, one of the other things I went without after the stroke was playing footy. When I had the stroke, I was on, on 96 games for Pennant Hills. But given how much work I had to do just to get back to being able to stand still, I put a line through my footy career, thinking I'd been forced into an early retirement, four games short of my 100th. And a couple of years ago, I was talking to our club's vice president, telling him how disappointed I was to have missed my 100th. And a couple of weeks later, he came back to me and said he'd spoken to our fourth grade coach, who was more than happy for me to play four games in fourth grade so that I could reach my 100th. <laughs> I, I didn't know how to react. When I had this stroke, my life just spiralled into, into uncertainty. I didn't know if I'd get a job, didn't know if I'd drive a car, didn't know if I'd meet a girl and get married. I didn't know what I was going to do with my life. Should I use my adversity to spur me on to greater things and start a foundation or ride on the Tour de France or become a Paralympian? Or should I just start complaining that life isn't fair, ask why me and spiral into depression? I didn't particularly like any of those options. Before the stroke, I was just a regular Joe Sacker Rolls, just a Jenny from the block. And all I wanted after the stroke... <laughs> All I wanted after the stroke was my normal life back, but that was going to be a lot easier said than done. And it was some advice I got from an old master who helped me realise what I had to do. One of my best football coaches used to say, focus on the game plan, the result will take care of itself. And that's what I've done. I've just, I haven't thought about, right, I want to be inspiring, I want to show people how they can live. I just got up every morning and thought, right, today I would do this, this and this. Did it as well as I could, and today's the result of that. I played in a night final for the Swans on the MCG. I've kicked goals on the SCG. I was best on ground in Pennant Hills' first first grade premiership. And I won a best and fairest for the Sandringham Reserves in the Victorian Football League. But I'm on the completely wrong slide. If I could have written the, the fairy tale recovery script for my life after the stroke, it would have said that eight years after touching noses with death, I'd come back to playing footy for Pennant Hills. And on the day of my 100th game, I'd kicked the first goal of the day in front of a crowd that included my little sister, who'd flown all the way back from England for one night just to watch the footy. And this is how that day panned out. So 
Well done, fat, really well done. Well done. Yes! Yes, mate. Never got that 50 bucks spewing. <laughs> so I played in a night final for the Swans on the MCG. I've kicked goals on the SCG. I was best on ground in Pennant Hills first, first grade premiership. And I won a best and fairest for the Sandringham Reserves in the Victorian Football League. But that goal you just saw for Pennant Hills fourth grade in a round 23 game at Earn Homes over in Pennant Hills is the most significant thing I've done in football. When I was playing footy when I was younger, I wanted to play in the AFL and win a Brownlow medal. And when I was working, I wanted to be the CEO. I thought that to be happy in life, I had to be a somebody. But then I started thinking differently. I realised I don't need to be a somebody, I just need to be somebody. As long as I could get home at the end of every day, look myself in the mirror and say I couldn't have tried any harder, I could be as proud as the next Joe Sacker rolls. All anyone can do in life is just get out there, give life the best crack they can and have faith that things will turn out the way they want them to. And that's exactly what I did when I went to Botswana to film a documentary. I was living in Melbourne for two years when I was playing footy and I heard a statistic about diabetes rates in rural Africa that said diabetes rates among rural Africans was a lot lower than it was amongst urban Africans. So I wanted to go to Botswana, well I wanted to go to Africa and film a documentary about how these rural Africans were living their lives and come back and show the Western world the secrets they had that were keeping diabetes rates at bay. Three months out though from when I was hoping to leave, I had no broadcast support, no financial support, an early budget of the filming put the cost at $100,000 and all I'd raised that far was 200 bucks that I got from auctioning off the stuffing out of a Christmas chicken to my auntie and uncle. So, so things weren't looking too good. But one afternoon in a fit of a desperation fueled impulsiveness, I dropped my budget from $100,000 to something more affordable, self-funded the trip myself, packed my handy cam, my tripod, and took off to Africa to film my diabetes awareness documentary. When I got to Botswana, I realised that, or I found out that filming in an African village isn't as simple as just going up to the chief's door, knocking, telling him you're here to film a documentary and asking where you can sleep. I had to submit a proposal to the chief and he said, I'll have to speak to the people and tell you tomorrow. So I went back the next morning and he said he spoke to the people, but they didn't, didn't believe me. So my dreams of filming this documentary that was going to change the face of human health went up in flames, and I had to make a decision. The easy thing to do would just be to drop my head, put my tail between my legs and slink home, say it was all too hard. But I thought, no, nah, bugger it, I'll, just, I'll stick around, I'll give something a crack. If it works, awesome. If it doesn't, you know, I tried. So I threw out the script I'd written for this diabetes awareness documentary, and I filmed, edited, directed and narrated a documentary about the search for my mojo. And for anyone that hadn't seen Austin Powers, mojo is self-belief or self-confidence. Mine was steadily declining since the stroke and it pretty much bottomed out when I went to, when I went to Africa. But then that trip get, refilled my mojo so much it was pretty much overflowing when I got home. So when I went and heard a guy give a talk about trying to climb Mount Kilimanjaro just a few months after he'd had a tumour removed, that had been wrapped around his spine. I thought, if this guy can do it, what's stopping me from at least trying? So I got, I uh, decided I was going to go to Africa and try and climb Mount Kilimanjaro. And my sister and my mate decided they'd join me. This is neither my sister nor my mate. This is just one of, <laughs> just one of our porters. But this gives you a good idea of what it's like climbing Kilimanjaro. The first four and a half to half days up Kili aren't anything too dramatically challenging. It's basically a long walk up a steep hill. It's the last day and a half that sorts out those who make it from those who don't. The last day and a half starts at the second last camp, which is about two k's back from where this port is sitting. You leave there first thing in the morning, walk all day along that dirt track you can see in the background until you hit the last camp at the volcano looking thing. You hit that camp at about two o'clock in the afternoon and go straight to bed and then try and get a few hours sleep because they wake you up at 10 o'clock that same night to try and make your attempt on the summit. So in the middle of the night, we started winding our way up the side of this, thankfully, dormant volcano. Then as we got near the top, I pulled my head up above the crater rim and then dragged the rest of my body up and stood on top of Mount Kilimanjaro next to my sister and my mate. 
When we made it to the top, the three of us walked over to the edge to look back over the path we'd walked the last four and a half days. And when I turned around to speak to my sister, she didn't say anything to me. She just cried. And it dawned on me then that she'd been told seven years earlier that her brother was probably going to die. So right then, I felt like all the decisions I'd made in my life were the right ones. And I was proud as hell just to be giving life a crack because things were falling my way. There's a, pretty, there's a pretty solid argument to say that a lot's gone against me over the years, but I couldn't disagree more. Last November, I married the girl of my dreams. And right now, we're on our honeymoon still since November. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We started on the central coast of New South Wales, went to Auckland, Thailand, Achuka, which was, we called part of our honeymoon. <laughs> And then Camden, which is like a stone's throw away from where we live in Sydney. And now we're in Melbourne. So and we plan on continuing our honeymoon for as long as we can. So what I want to leave you guys with today is that we all have one thing in common in this room today. Every single one of us is going to face disappointment. Not everybody's going to have a stroke or get diabetes. But at some point in our lives, we'll all feel like things are going against us. And when that happens, you have a decision to make. You could do the same thing you always do and probably get the same result, or you could think a little bit differently. So if the rain starts falling in your life, you could run inside and find some shelter, and you probably will stay dry, but I hope you just rip off your shoes and socks, run outside and go and play in the puddles. Thank you.